And just like we promised, Ezekiel Yaito joins us this morning on Off the Press. Ezekiel, it's good to have you join us. Utwekong, that's a title, if you don't already it's know. Always, <laughs> it's, it's always a Yeah, delight. it's always a privilege and a pleasure. Thanks so much for having Thank me. Thank you so much for joining us. Let's run through the pages now. We have the leadership. The punch is also there. Hopefully, we look at the Guardian amongst others. Uh, but I'd like to start off with the leadership newspaper. The uh, banner caption talks about post-election crisis. Conflicting Edo, that's a Edo, uh, Edo state, the FCT court orders on settled Labour Party. Uh, that's bold caption that you find. Fate of national chairman Abu hangs in the balance and court injunctions uh, cripples party activities. A boy in Labour Party governorship candidate accuses uh, you know, Abu of forgery. That's uh, underneath the rider now. Have mercy on a Koro Madu, wife. Uh, that's what the former president Olusegun Obasanjo begs the United Kingdom court. Now, I, I remember having a conversation with someone. I think it was just yesterday, and I think that my name was Common because every other time you hear Messi, you know what is that? Then she reminded me that Messi is, you know, just what everybody says every other time. Okay. Just before we move away, federal government secures $800 million world banking funding for palliatives. That's subsidy removal. Uh, so we have gone to bore, you know, to cushion the effect of, you know, the subsidy uh, removal. And that's very interesting. Outgoing United Kingdom envoy. I love Nigerian food. Dance, I'll be back. Okay, that's okay. I can agree with that. 775 killed, 1,000. 321 injured by IEDS in the Northeast. That's according to uh, the UN's report. Easter, federal government declares Friday and Monday a public holiday. Uh, tomorrow is a Friday. That's what it means. That's a public holiday. And Monday is also a public holiday. Uh, happy holidaying already. Then we move our attention to the punch. New House leadership, opposition reps elect. Opposition reps elect plot to upstage APC. Opposition reps elects plots to upstage APC. And so the politics and politicking continues. Opposition reps elect meets from greater majority bloc to tackle the APC. And group wants members against APC infiltration targets key house position. Be warned, 2015 Saraki Dagora action won't be allowed, APC tells reps elect. These are some of the riders you have underneath the caption on, on the Punch newspaper. The federal government borrows $800 million for mass transit and cash transfer. That's uh, the report that you have also. I think that this headline might just be dominating all of the front pages of the national dailies. Fresh promissory notes increasing national debt. That's according to the debt uh, management you know, office, the DMO. Equator Madu Obasanjo begs United Kingdom for leniency. We talked about that on our top trending. And just before we move away, Okada Rider on the rampage, Kill Corp, injured DPO. That ha also happened in Lagos. Uh, very unfortunate. In the course, because if you live in Lagos, I'm sure you're very conversant with the ban on Okada now. And I can tell you for sure that, you know, these guys are back. So it was just like, hey, we took a breather and then we're back then. Okay, Lagos Ibadan Express, uh, you find ready April 30th and drainage delay or your, uh, or your section, that's what the federal government is saying. I will just leave it at that. Uh, so we move on to the Guardian then, and then we look at the nation. The Guardian says, neighbors feed fat on Nigeria's poorly funded inefficient seaports. Mm, what neighbors? Local ports get two billion naira budgetary allocation eight years, and ports recovering with current reforms. MPA boss is saying, I think it's something we need to look into. FNF ferry leaders tackle uh, Lai Mohammed over treason, and polls claim these conversations would continue. INEC and imperative of financial accountability. INEC and the imperative of financial accountability. Opposition parties plot to produce reps speaker. Nigeria, South Africa, Egypt slowing regional growth, says the World Bank. Oh no, that's not fantastic. Then uh, we just move away from the nation newspaper. It's like saying you're in the ship, you're in a ship, uh, and then the ship is about to sink, and then they found out that you are the reason for the ship sinking. So we're moving away from the Guardian to look at the, the Nation newspaper. 
quickly. The nation says showing card to Tinubu make part dev uh, devolution a priority. Uh, make part devolution a priority. I warned Peter Abi that his supporters would make him lose the election. And I saw the thought. Uh, former President Lushigun Obasanjo writes United Kingdom court over a quarter Madu and his wife asking that uh, justice should be tempered with a bit of mercy. APC moves to reconcile Adamu Omishore with Lukman. Six die, 27 million recovered from accidents seen in Oshun and Trump denounces felony charges against him. These are some of the headlines. Also quite interesting that he's also a front-runner for the 2024 elections. A court suspends Labour Party National Chairman Secretary orders. Then you continue post-election issues. I'm sad to leave Nigeria, says British High Commissioner. Well, it's okay. You can always visit. That's the size of it this morning on uh, the pages that we've been able to look at. Then we have Ezekiel Niaitok. Ezekiel, thank you so much for making our time to be with us this morning on Off the Press. We really appreciate your time. Thank you, as always. Okay, so um, uh, quickly, uh, the, the headlines are quite interesting, but uh, I think we start off with the letter that was written by former President Ulushagan uh, Obasanjo to the United Kingdom court, pleading for mercy on behalf of Ekwere Madu and his wife. Uh, what are your thoughts, really? You know, the very first thing is that um, you need to take the issues in context. Number one is that a crime is a crime. You do the crime, you do the time. That's number one. And that letter addresses that very well. Number two is that there's always what you call prerogative of mercy. And um, under certain circumstances, if you take time to read that letter, you will have nothing short of the highest level of respect for president, former president Obasanjo, that man comes time and time again to show himself as a nationalist. Why do I say this? In a country where you have a man like that, there are several international dimensions, and Obasanjo has come in to play a role that, in my opinion, should have been played by the federal government if they had what I call emotional intelligence. What a way for the North, let me just put it that, to tell the South is no, we're not against you. By doing what? By saying this, just take it on a national platform. This man has been in the Senate, if, I, if my whatever serves me right, for about um, three terms. Okay, and is a current serving senator and was once the number two man in the Senate. And you said, Look, Nigeria is not like this. Yes, he might have been occasioned by you know a certain you know situation, family situation he found himself in, but you see, he didn't do it clandestinely. He actually went to the embassy, he got the visa, he boarded the flight, he came with it. But what he did was wrong under the current law. So please temper justice with mercy. That's what he said. Now imagine if this came from the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Imagine how you would have shut up the mouth of IPOB. Imagine how you would have told the Easterners that, look, my goodness, this man is not a Hausa man, he's an Igbo man, and look at what the federal government has done. Is there a, an antecedent to this? Yes, there is. There was a young lady, I think Zainab or something like that, that was caught in Saudi Arabia with cocaine. I think it was hard drug, can't remember exactly what. And the penalty for that was death. The federal government, Mr. President, mandated ordered, instructed the Attorney General of the Federation to liaise with the, um, with the um, external affairs um, minister and then get to them and see how they can plead for that young lady. If they could plead for that young lady for leniency, they could on the double plead for the, press, for, for the deputy senate president one time, a serving senator, and somebody who has contributed immensely to national progress over the years, 
they could have said this man did not he could have done it he invested it and found a way of taking it to india but he did it openly he probably was ignorant for whatever he's worth he's broken the law but we are saying please have mercy on him now that shouldn't have come from abbas and john no should have come from the president of the federal republic of nigeria and that again like i said is the aspect of emotional intelligence that would have led to national healing that would have gone beyond the man and, and it's a good case because it's a father trying to save a, a dying child you understand me not a man who is trying to make money you, you understand so he, he, they had grounds to be able to to make an emotional a sentimental appeal but they did not and who stepped in again former president of Basanjo. so for me he he takes my salute this morning I, I always feel very proud that's why from time to time I put up my picture with him and people say, why are you leaving this man? I said, no. Every time he does things that makes me proud. He's my father and I have a lot of respect for him. I do. Mm. Okay. Uh, but you know the case, uh, the issue of leniency now and is left within the discretion of this country. It's a sovereign nation and, yeah. you know, uh, whatever it is that they decide to do with all of that will just also be accepted. Because it is what it is, unfortunately. Yeah, the best you can do is plead. That's all you can do. Yes, and so pleading for a lesser judgment, not to say that he shouldn't be punished. But whatever it right. is that's that right. will be done should just not be as strong as he should have been, uh, based right. on you know character and what have you. Well, uh, it can be very emotional if you, if you want to think about it and go through it. But uh, then we'll definitely follow up and see what happens. Just maybe, you know, the Nigerian government as well, look, like you have, uh, you know, asked and said that it would have been possible to have the president uh, make that letter or make that request. And it would go a long way, you know, to heal the wounds of the people uh, in Nigeria. But then again, we need to move away from that. There's also another interesting conversation on the front page, and I'm sure that that's what a lot of Nigerians have been talking about since yesterday up until this moment, is the fact that in the course of trying to uh, ensure that, hey, when subsidies removed in, in June, uh, and petrol probably might be selling at 700 or thereabout, according to uh, the marketers, the question uh, that's on so on the punch is also on the leadership newspaper dominating all of the papers this morning is that um, people would not have to suffer there would just be uh, palliative put out there to cushion the effect then again we see on this paper that the government has gone ahead to borrow 800 million dollars uh, to uh, from the world bank to ensure that uh, this also goes to some nigerians to cushion the effect of it as it can yeah i took as as one who is uh, very interested in government and governance and how the people fear. What, what do you make of this move by the government? You know, each time I see things like this, I, 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 I feel very unhappy. Absolutely. I feel depressed, you know, uh, I would say so, because the level of insincerity in government using the name of the poor is infuriating. At the end of the day, there's a loan of about $800 million. And you come to do an aggregate of the use to which these funds will be deployed. Number one, you say you are doing conditional cash transfer. And I ask myself, to who? At what exchange rate? What's the level of transparency and accountability that we'll find in it? Will it be the same as the time when you are giving food to children in school who are at home? You know, these things bother me because, number one, you are getting a loan that's going to be repaid. Number two, you are getting it in the name of the poor. Number three, to what extent... Can we see how this will benefit the poor on the long run? So there are too many issues. And I can tell the federal government what to do with such funds to really benefit the people in the rural areas. Can we deploy it to rural development? All this money I want to give for people, money to eat, money to eat. Those things 
just don't make sense. Because at the end of the day, you create what you call a dependency syndrome. Look at all the money to eat on election day. They are finished. All that money is finished. Long before the, the governors are even sworn in, the money is finished. There's a video I'm doing. I'm like, bros, how far? Where the money? It's finished. And the man has not even been sworn in yet. They never pass away in the person. That means the four years never even start. So the question is, how are we thinking as government? When will we start to have people that have this heart, this level of sympathy for the poor? You know, something happened, you know, I won't be able to give details. I was called to, give, to be given a job by a governor, and that job was to change my life. Something too, too good to be true. And when the governor sent for me and I went to him, I, tell, I told him, can we have a four eyes meeting? Because there were some other people. And he said, okay, so we moved to a private place. I asked him, sir, is this project for real or for empowerment? He asked why. I said, if it's for real, I'll be grateful to you for the rest of my life because it's going to change my life it's when I need money. But if it is for empowerment, I don't want because it is a project that is also benefit the poor. And I will not see myself being part of the money that is meant for the poor that is being deployed to the rich just so that... You know, he looked till tomorrow that man has the highest level of respect for me. And he told me what was to be done. And I was very grateful. And I was really empowered. It, it really helped me. But it was a project that directly benefited the poor. What am I saying? You can have your own fallout, as it were. But make sure that when you call the name of the poor, that the money actually gets to the poor. Don't use the name of the poor to enrich yourself. That's what's really bothering me in this whole thing. And then end up giving a loan that he will have to come and pay or his children when you have left office and you and your children, all of you, are safely out of the country. How many, how many former this or that are here with us and their children? Well, they take off because they've, they've created an alternate you know, uh, environment for themselves while they were in office. I, I think that there's an urgent need for us to really do things that will benefit the poor. That's really where my problem is. On so, that. So, so, the problem, so the problem is not about the fact that we're borrowing to execute this sort of plan. Uh, is it that the problem is that uh, you don't trust the entire process that these funds will get to the poor. You couldn't have captured it better, exactly what it is. Hmm. But, but what's the rationale? Uh, I know this is going to be the crux of our conversation, you know, for the second first topic when we proceed. But just a little more before we move away from that. Yeah, uh, do yeah. you think that it's rational that we probably have to borrow in the first instance? Uh, when you're taking a loan to solve the problem. And uh, when you juxtapose that with the cost of the, the subsidy removal for 2023, uh, is it not as good as saying, go ahead and, and, and continue paying subsidy? I, I, I'll tell you this. One of the things I wanted to do as a governor was to get 10 people from every village. And we have, um, you know, 2,226 villages in Akwaibom. Get two, two, 10 people from each village, youths. Train them for three months. Three months training, not just throw money at them like this people are doing. Train them. Part of the training is regularity. You go to work, you go to the training by 8 a.m. You are there till 1, you go on one, one hour break. You know, it brings out certain things, certain disciplines in you, and then tell them about bookkeeping. Tell three solid months. At the end of that period, give them between 500,000 and say a million to do certain things you have trained them to do. What you end up doing is create a new class of, of employers who are productive in nature. Now, even the, 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 the tax you get from them, which they will very happily pay because they saw country that trained them and gave them the capacity, that tax over period can even be used to aggregate the repayment of the facility. So what am I saying? There's nothing wrong in borrowing. But let the borrowing not be what will just go into consumption, what you just take care of yourself. Let, let's have a little more thinking process into what we do such that it is sustainable, it creates more enjoyment, employment, it creates more wealth, 
and it is sustainable and not what creates a dependency syndrome. When you dash people with money, you create a dependency syndrome. Because when that money is gone, they will come for the next one. So, mm. so well, away from that, the leadership is uh, another interesting headline that you find there. It talks about post-election crisis and then the fact that there's conflict in a duo, the FCT court uh, orders on settled Labour Party. W what do you make of this? I mean, we think that after the election, there should be peace, especially when there was a peace accord. Uh, that's a lot of rhyme. So, the peace accord. Yeah, the peace accord was intra party. Okay. But the war now is inter party. And, um, you know, I was in Akwaibom, I was um, um, a little bit involved in the Labour Party thing because. Mm. I was head of projects and um, even the minister in housing under the big tent, okay? There was a relationship between my party and Labour Party and the other parties under what they call the big tent. Now, before then, the National Consultative Front, where uh, Professor Padutomi was the chairman, I was the head of projects. So, and at the time, I was the chairman of the, uh, 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 the, the big party merger committee, you know, the mega party merger committee. So I was a very vital part of it. Now, one of the understandings is that at the end of the day, there's a working relationship between the different parties. I'm one of the very few Nigerians that was openly endorsed by the obedient movement that was not in Labour Party, okay? In which case, it was like, and the Yai talk is adopted in a quiet boom, you know, under the labor, the, the obedient movement, the big tent. And it was done on tape by no less a person that, than the chairman of that whole organization, Professor Patutomi. What am I trying to say? Even with that, there were still issues of people going behind and getting certain things and levels of compromises and this and that. So there was a lot of disquiet within the Labour Party. That is why you'd have, you know, the, the candidate of um, a boy in state saying that he was unceremoniously removed and that his signatures were forged. So there's a lot of bottled up, you know, angst, you know, uh, anger, emotion by some of the members of Labour Party that felt they were, you know, hard done by the, by the system. And as a result, a lot of things are coming up. Now, what you have as of today is two courts, one in the FCT, one in a Edo state, giving conflicting statements as to the leadership of the Labour Party as of today. My, my, my hope and prayer is that there will be some elders that will be able to come into it and kind of put the party together because the war is not over. If they are going to the tribunal that like they've gone already, they need the party. It is a party that will go to the tribunal. So they need to put themselves, their house in order. And again, one might look at the possibility of there being a fifth columnist in this whole thing. Is there any way that APC or any other party is coming into labor to destabilize the system, to make sure that they are not as organized in the way they want to pursue their case at the tribunal? It's a lot of things that the, 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 the labor leaders within the, the, let's say, the big tent, Professor Patutomi and his um, group have a big job to step into labor party. Even the NLC also have a big job to come in to stabilize the system so that the revolution that the Labour Party kind of stands for with a, a man like Mr. Peter Obi being the face of that movement is not truncated. So we must be careful not to make sure that um, the baby is thrown away with the bath water. I, th I think Labour Party leaders need to come on board now, not just to watch and see, because there's a, an extent it will reach and it will become too messy and um, you know the, the answer might not come too easily this is the time for them to to come together and decide what to do they look at the cases in question and if there's need to advise the former the chairman to step aside that be if not so look at the other side pacify them and let there be peace in the labor party mm. uh let's let's get to you know the economy of nigeria and that's on the guardian it's uh you know, very, very important to look at this. It talks about the fact that uh, there are reports saying that the neighbors are feeding fat on Nigeria's poorly funded uh, inefficient seaport. 
However, they are very expensive in South Africa, um, you know, in uh, the region, West Africa, but they're not properly funded by the government. And that does not allow for efficiency at the end of the day, uh, you know, especially when that can be as a means of revenue contribute to development. What, what do you make of it? Do you also have statistics to this effect that, you know, for the past eight years, the allocation that has gotten to uh, airports facilities is about 1.7 billion era. This figure has been dismissed like a drop in the ocean. Do you agree, uh, you know, with this expert and those who are saying that our seaports are underfunded? You see, the, uh, the issue of the seaports is one that needs what we call a national discourse. There's a That's lot what we're having? <laughs> yes, there's a lot of things that are not straightforward with our seaports, the Nigerian Ports Authority, their operations, their modus operandi. You know, there are many things that are just not um, right. Then the system is managed by people that don't understand how business works. When you say that government has no business in business, it's the most stupid thing I've heard. Because government is the management of the resources of the generality of the people. And what is business? Business is making good management of the resources to the larger interests of the shareholders. So within this context, we now look at chapter 2, section 14, subsection 2B of the, the constitution that says that the security and welfare of the people shall be the primary purpose of government. That is a matching order. In business, like I mean private sector business, the, 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 the matching order in business is that you got to make profit. As much profit as you can make, the better for you. And you can bend the law, just don't break it. You break the door, you, you know, like the experimental uh, case, you, you know, you, you do the crime, you do the time, you know. So what am I trying to say coming down here? If we had people who think well in government, they will realize that the seaports are part of our highest revenue earning and generating, you know, um, um, system or setup. Within that context, wise thinking shows you that if you have a cow that you milk from, you have a choice either to keep draining the milk without taking feeding the cow and then. No, so um, I mean, as you can no, to, because we're, we're... This. It's, no, I let them end on this. It's very important. At a stage, you discover that nothing is coming out, but if you feed that cow well it will continue to give you more milk. It's a business thinking argument. If you apply that to the seaport, because they generate funds for you. So what do you do? You make sure that you fund them well. You make sure that you control them well. You make, make sure you put systems and structures and processes well that makes for transparency, accountability, and happiness with the workers. And what do you get in return? Higher returns more efficient money and that takes somebody who thinks well but when you have people who say just bring the money just bring the money just bring the money they will end up sucking that place dry not funding it and at the end of the day you don't get anything good out of it again mm. well we we have to let it go at this point in time but for me it's just uh i mean i continue to ask the question as to if government is really really uh, in the business of, should be in the business of managing business, uh, a good business manager, and, and they have any business in business, because if, if it were oh, the government case... Is, government is managing your life. No, no, but, but, but you can't also, I mean, uh, if you look at this report now, the complaint here is yeah. that the allocation, budgetary allocation, yeah. you know, to the seaports have not been anything to write them about for the past because six years. Because we have people who don't understand. They don't understand the dynamics. But then of again, it's government. Sure. Then again, it's government. It's not you and I. Yes. It's still government that is oh, making this. Be, look, government manages your life and mine. And the most competent people should be put in there. If not so, you and I are they, then become the problem because we, the elites, should understand that government is the management of your life and my life. And that I cannot take the risk of being where my ma life is managed by an incompetent person. So I think we, the elites, need to step up to the game and make sure that whoever goes for any government office must be the brightest and the best. If not so, my life and your life is in trouble. Uh, we have to let it go at, at, at this point. Uh, I'm sure that we would have, we should have a robust conversation around this issue. 
uh, in terms of our seaports. And the fact that usually the argument will be concessioning, which is like a guise. It feels like government is hiding under that guise to evade injection, injecting funds into this sector. It's like saying, hey, wherever your money is, that's where your heart is, and you know what you're coming from that area. But then, thank you so much, Ezekiel and Yaito, for being part of the show this morning. I always, always a pleasure. Uh, like to have you on the show. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's the size of our conversation this morning on Off the Press. We just take a breather when we return. We'll delve to a first major conversation right here. We'll have a guest who's a legal practitioner who joins us. We need to understand what a treason is. That's a very huge thing. If you are declared an enemy of the state, then you need to hide for your life. Stay with us. We'll, have, we'll be right back after this timeout. <laughs>